some people say masks don't make a difference. Fact is, if four out of five of us wore a mask in public, the spread of COVID-19 could be significantly reduced. That's what I believe. Hi, my name is Reggie Robinson, and I'm Community Coordinator for Health Recovery Services. Welcome to another edition of HRS Presents. July is National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. In May of 2008, the U.S. House of Representatives announced July as B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Health Awareness Month. The resolution was sponsored by Representative Albert Wynn and co-sponsored by a large bipartisan group to achieve two goals. One, improve access to mental health treatment and services and promote public awareness of mental illness. And two, enhance public awareness of mental illness and mental illness among minorities. Mental health includes your emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how you think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how you handle stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, problems with mental health are very common in the United States, with an estimated 50% of all Americans diagnosed with a mental illness or disorder at some point in their lifetime. Anyone can experience the challenges of mental illness regardless of their background. But between COVID-19's significant impact on the black community and the history of discrimination in our country, the last few months have been a mental challenge for many African Americans. A recent Census Bureau survey finds anxiety and depression spiked for African Americans with about 41% reporting significant signs of mental health concerns. Since July is Minority Health Month, you might think it's the perfect time to seek mental health services or treatment. But despite advances in health equity, disparities in mental health care still persist for people of color. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality reports that racial and ethnic minority groups in the United States are less likely to have access to mental health services, less likely to use community mental health services, more likely to use emergency departments, and more likely to receive lower quality care. As a result, minority groups are at a higher risk for poor mental health outcomes, including depression and suicide in some cases. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, and the CDC, in 2017, 10.5% or 3.5 million young adults aged 18 to 25 had serious thoughts of suicide, including 8.3% of non-Hispanic blacks and 9.2% of Hispanics. Also in 2017, 7.5% or 2.5 million young adults aged 18 to 25 had a serious mental illness including 7.6% of non-Hispanic Asians, 5.7% of Hispanics, and 4.6% of non-Hispanic Blacks. Also, feelings of anxiety and other signs of stress may become more pronounced during a global pandemic, and people in some racial and ethnic minority groups may respond more strongly to the stress of a pandemic or crisis. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, one in five Americans live with a mental health condition. NAMI says America's entire mental health system needs improvement. That includes serving and helping marginalized communities. We want to raise awareness about disparities in the mental health system and what we can do about them, NAMI CEO Daniel H. Gillison Jr. said in a statement. He continued, Mental health conditions don't discriminate, and neither should our mental health system. We are calling for systematic change and improved access to culturally competent care so no one feels alone in their journey. During Minority health, Mental Health Awareness Month, you can get involved by getting educated 
on the disparities of mental health care for minority groups. You can also support local nonprofits tackling mental illness, such as NAMI. Remember, you are not alone. Enjoy our show. Supervisor of Vinton County Outpatient, and I would love to introduce you to our wonderful staff. Hi, I'm Connie Zickafoos. I'm here at the Vinton County Outpatient Office. I work here doing individual counseling, case management. We work with the MAC Clinic, and we have an office manager here, Deanna Robinette, and a part time counselor, Amanda Lee. Hope to see you guys soon. Hi, my name is Amanda Lee. I'm a counselor here at Vinton Outpatient with Health Recovery Services. Um, right now we offer individual counseling and have the ability to do telehealth appointments as well as phone calls. So come and see us if you need to. Welcome to another episode of HRS Presents. We are thrilled today to be joined by Sean Stover, who is the reentry coordinator for Ohio Means Jobs, Athens County. Good morning, Sean. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I, I thank you so much for joining us today on the program. You know, we've worked together on a, a few coalitions, a lot of different meetings, uh, the Athens Opiate Task Force. Athens Hope, and I've admired and appreciated the work that you do. And I know you're very busy, so thank you so much for taking the time out to be with us this morning. Thank you. So you work out of uh, Ohio Means Jobs, Athens County. Can you tell us a bit about the work that they do? Um, Ohio Means Jobs recently moved from the Plains to West Union Street in Athens, on 510 West Union Street, because it's a larger facility and allows for more privacy and actually better conference rooms and easier access. Um, Ohio Means Jobs main goal is to help people find employment, helping with job searching, interviewing, placement, training. We have a, a very successful Aspire program, used to be called ABLE, where people can work on their GED. We have the WIOA program that helps with education, helps with training for especially short-term certifications for people that are real popular right now. Um, and we have employment counselors. We have a lot of different uh, county workers now here that process food stamp medical applications. Um, and it's, it's nice to have them here so I can consult with them when I have a person that's having a difficult time with their case. Uh, and we, we just kind of try to do everything we can to help people to get to where they need to be, especially with the employment or training. Um, one thing I do want to add is we have a computer lab, and due to COVID-19, it's open by appointment only. Pretty much everyone here is seeing people by appointment only, uh, and we have four computers available for that. So if someone wants to schedule a computer, 
they can contact the uh, main office of Job and Family Services or Ohio Means Jobs, and uh, mainly for job searching, employment related uh, items. Yes, I would imagine with um, what has gone on with uh, unemployment during COVID-19, there's never been a greater need for those services. Absolutely. And, and unemployment is run by the state of Ohio Job and Family Services, yet they refer people to us for questions and concerns. We can basically give them guidance on how to file for unemployment, but we can't do unemployment for them. We can get them on the computer, give them the information, um, and that's frustrating for people. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of systems to navigate. Uh, and, it, you know, I understand that uh, Ohio Means Jobs works with job seekers, uh, employers, uh, veterans, uh, yes. child care workers. I mean, just a little bit of everybody. I know that I have uh, done some uh, work with some presentations for some of the educational groups there and really uh, uh, very important work that's being done at Ohio Means Jobs. Absolutely. So uh, it reminds me, uh, Veteran Services is up front of the building. Uh, we're located in the back and I just had a veteran yesterday that came in and needed some information and I was easily able to walk him up to the county veterans office and they helped him everything he needed at that point so I was really happy about that that's a nice a real good service for Athens and to have here absolutely yeah a great location uh, there I've, I've seen the new location I haven't visited yet but yeah. you know uh, you know, once things get kind of opened back up and, and all that, I'm I can't wait to to see your your new uh, your new digs there. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna have you for a tour. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, let's talk about the uh, reentry task force. And I understand that, that you're doing uh, you're he heading that up, but you've got an entire uh, task force that works on reentry. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, here, here's the thing with the reentry task force. I'm the chairperson for it, so I kind of bring the community members together and the, uh, the participants and whoever is interested in, in the reentry in our community. But reentry is a community. Reentry is not an office. Reentry happens at the libraries. Reentry happens at, at your facilities, HRS. Reentry happens uh, in the parks. Reentry happens with family, with friends. Reentry happens all over. Uh, so it's nice to have this task force so we know who's doing what to help people with reentry, helping people get reestablished from incarceration back into their communities. Uh, it's a great group where we can get together and say, hey, here's what we're doing. We're offering these services or we have this special program. Uh, and then people can access that easier. So it's a great form of connection and communication with that. Uh, so you're helping Everybody's doing reentry. I mean, it's it's wonderful for the community. Yes, yes. So you're helping people who are ret returning citizens uh, from incarceration. What kinds of barriers do they face? Well, initially, it's the shock and the anxiety of like I'm out now. I have to start getting things together. I have to start preparing for supporting myself and taking care of myself, and not going down that road again where I'm into criminal activity. So the biggest thing I see when people are coming out is help with clothing and hygiene items, transportation. It might be a gas voucher, a bus pass, uh, and then working on those soft skills and those social skills for employment. We do a lot of mock interviewing where people can talk about what they've done in the past and they can talk about that's not the person they are and they can represent it in a way that, hey, I've made changes. Uh, when people are inside, they do a lot of different things. They get, they get their a GED, they get certifications, they go to therapy and treatment inside. Uh, the prisons aren't the same as they used to be. They're more therapeutic, I think, now than they've ever been as far as helping people along that path. So with me, I do an intake, start with the basic needs, because unless you have met the basic needs, you cannot build into those self-sufficiency needs or becoming what we call self-actualized, where you find your path and you take that path and you stay on that path. So, so for me, it's like reentry for one person is different than for another, but the basic needs are all the same. The housing, I can't tell you how many people are couch surfing, staying in a shed behind their parents' house, staying in a camper, living in a car. It, it's amazing 
how it's amazing how people survive when they get out and then we see them progress and we see them move on to better situations. And you mentioned uh, therapy programs that sometimes happen um, um, for, for people. Um, and uh, I, I would imagine there's a connection between substance use disorder issues uh, and people who are needing reentry. Would I be correct in that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, probably 70 to 80%, we've done statistics over the years, but 70 to 80% of the people I work with coming out of incarceration have had some kind of recovery substance misuse issues in their past that's kind of guided them to make bad decisions where they ended up in the criminal justice system. So that needs to be addressed. That's an ongoing, uh, uh, ongoing issue for people. So addressing it inside and getting that started helps them when they get out to say, you know, I don't want to come back here. I want to continue with my progress. So I think that's really important for recovery to happen in so many different institutions and environments because it needs to be available for people. Sure. And what do you think is most effective when you're working with a person in recovery? The biggest thing I hear from people are the connections they make in their communities, connections they make through NAAA meetings, connections they make through their therapy sessions with like health recovery services or other substance treatment centers. Uh, the connections they make with their family and friends and the hope that they get from those connections. So it's kind of like, like I say, the community working together in order to create this, okay, so I can't talk to my HRS counselor today, but I can call Sean and talk to him. Or I can't talk, I can't uh, get services uh, for something and I can go to the library and use their computer and do some research. It, it's amazing how adaptive people are when they're in a, in a bad situation and they know there's resources out there, they will go to those resources. So you help people make connections and find resources. And, and you know, I, I've had uh, friends and family members who've been incarcerated and re-entered um, society. And I do know that there are a lot of those barriers. I mean, one uh, that I was working with uh, just recently uh, has had a terrible time just trying to get an ID. Uh, he wants to get a job. In order to get a job, he has to have an ID. In order to get an ID, he has to have a birth certificate, and he can't find his birth certificate anywhere. Uh, in order to um, uh, get, you know, an ID, he also needs a Social Security card, and uh, so he started trying to get a Social Security card. Well, they asked for a birth certificate. It was just, a, you know, unbelievable, um, you know, bunch of systems that he was trying to navigate. So what kinds of specific uh, help do you give for people who are just trying to do those basic things? You mentioned housing, getting a job. And that's the thing I see probably most of all with, with people is not being able to get a state ID or identification because a lot of the people that are incarcerated were transient when they left. They didn't have anywhere to keep their things. They didn't have anyone that they could trust to give things to. So what's, what's great about Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections is when a person's released with an offender ID, it's a green ID, they can take that to the BMV with like $10 for whatever the state ID costs now. Uh, and they can, train, they can get a state ID with that. If they keep, some people I don't think know that or some people lose that. So, so as soon as I talk to someone, I said, do not lose that green state ID from prison. Now, if someone's coming out of a treatment center, say like STAR or like the counseling center or somewhere like that, it's a little bit more difficult um, and it's a little harder to get those things together. So what we do is we start with the health department. We try to help them get a birth certificate and then they can order a social security card. And it's it's such a process, um, sure. and, and there's reason for that. I'm sure that with identity theft and everything, there, there's a reason for that. Um, but basically, the DRC, now this is something new. Department of Rehab and Corrections is talking about releasing people with an actual state ID when they get out now. They're, this wow. is in the Because yeah. they have seen, and they've heard the complaints from the community that, hey, this is a big issue for people. Sure. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. Great idea. Yeah. Uh, so another thing that I know that returning citizens deal with is stigma. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, and, and that's one of those things where you helping working with helping professionals and providers to build themselves up and how they present as far as like when a person has good self-esteem and they feel good about themselves, it comes out, it emanates from them. Um, and that's what we do is help people to, to kind of accept, okay, I'm in recovery. I have a substance misuse issue, but I'm not that person. That does not define me. So what we all do is we work with them is like, you know what? You made some mistakes. We've all made mistakes. You know, we're going to get past that mistake, you know, keep your head up and walk tall. And that's, I think, coming from multiple sources is the most effective to help people with the stigma. As far as the community and society, I think the things that we do, like Adam's Hope, the, the event we had in Nelsonville is a, a terrific event where we were out there, we're out at the library in Nelsonville, and we're saying, hey, we're here, and this is our message, and you're going to listen to it. And we're people, and we matter. Absolutely. Things like that, I think, need to be more of media and, and just kind of promoting events. Great. That's great. Well, I, I'm sure you have dozens uh, of success stories. Uh, can you tell me uh, just, just one or two, uh, someone who's come out of prison and rebuilt their life? Well, and here's the thing with success. For each person, it's different. Guy gets a driver's license after three years, that's success. Guy gets a job after waiting six months and getting a lot of no's, that's success. Gets a house, gets a car. These are all the successes that we build on. But the major successes I have seen are through the peer mentor program where people that have been in recovery go through training and they give back to their communities and they are the best instructors and teachers because if you've lived it, you can talk about it. So the peer mentoring, I've had several peer mentorings that have been in our sober living facilities that have graduated from there and actually went back to become peer mentors in the facilities where they initially were released to. And to me, I mean, this I've had several that have done that and it's not me, it's our community. It's the guidance that they've gotten. But I, I was, I've been so, happy to be a part of that you know like hey i was a part of this puzzle and, and i like that i love that and i love when people come back and they tell their story and and they say i thank you so much or i thank reggie so much or i thank my counselor so much it's so wonderful so so the success stories for your mentors that go come out of prison they go through their treatment they do everything they need to do and they give back to their to their other peers in recovery and they're such an inspiration. And, th and that's, that's the thing that I just grab onto. I love that. Oh, that's, that's really exciting. As a person in long-term uh, recovery myself, I'm especially interested in those issues. And um, you know, I'm so interested, as a matter of fact, uh, that I became a peer recovery supporter myself. So I went through the, that process and got the certification. And I know the great work uh, that's being done there. So how do people access your services? Um, I take referrals from pretty much everywhere. I'll tell you what, the Adult Parole Authority um, has been wonderful about when people are released. If I haven't met them through a video conference in prison or through a correspondence, the Adult Parole Authority, uh, the POs are trying everything they can do to keep their people out and get their people to be successful. So they're like, hey, go see Sean. He's going to help you out with some of the things that they can't do because their caseloads are so large. Oh, sure. They can't manage everyone. So, so I, I on, a, on a kind of a micro level, am able to help individuals more uh, that meet our you know, requirement qualifications. So, so basically, anyone can call me through the Ohio Means Job Center. Uh, we're, we're online. Uh, we have a, a website that a person can go to and learn about our services, Ohio Means Jobs Reentry Services, are all our services at Ohio Means Jobs. Um, but you just never know where a referral's gonna come to. The other day, a mother called me, and her son has been in prison for three years, and she was panicked, and she said, I saw your information on the website. I'm reaching out to you, I don't know where to start. And I said, start by bringing him in to see me. You know, that's the best start you can do, because, She's not an expert in reentry. She's not an expert in recovery or the field. 
So reaching out to the experts in the field is the best way to get started and provide that support. Sure. And, and then as you know, it's up to the participant to, to try to follow that path and to, to uh, accept our resources and to make those changes. Well, I thank you so very much for being on our program today. Any final words that you want to share with our audience? Uh, the, biggest thing, the biggest thing that I can share is, like you were talking about reduction in stigma and sharing the hope that we have in our communities and working together. An individual cannot beat this. An individual cannot be the primary community champion. We need multiple community champions. We're, we're across the board with faith-based uh, substance misuse treatment centers, libraries, community partners. Um, and, and, and something I didn't mention too is the prosecutor's office has a great program where they really help people and they follow them through that process of recovery. So my biggest thing is be a part of that community, be a part of the recovery and reentry community jump in there. Whatever you can do, you're doing. I mean, anything small stacked up is a big thing. Yes. That's what I say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, again, we appreciate and admire the great work that you do. We thank you so much. And uh, we hope we can have you back on the program again at some point in the thank future. You. Any new developments, give us a call. We'd love to have you back on. Absolutely. Thank you, Reggie. Appreciate thank you. you. Thank you. Well, we've been speaking with Sean Stover, who's the reentry coordinator for Ohio Means Jobs Athens County. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you soon. My name's Erin, and today we're going to be making something called Pump Up Pizza. And it's just kind of a fun spin off on what we normally eat um, with just a little bit more vegetables. So let me show you what, what I have here. Okay, so I've got my cannelli beans here. I have my canned corn, and both of these are rinsed and drained. So I, I went ahead and rinsed them and put them in their own separate bowl. I have my shredded carrots. I have my tomatoes, I have my oregano and my basil here as well. I have two cloves of garlic, we only need one but I, I have two just in case. Um, I have a small head of broccoli, my green pepper, my zucchini, and my two slices of pita bread that, and this is going to be what all these ingredients end up on at the end. And then I also have my potato masher. Now mine looks a little bit different than yours, but that's just because mine is metal. Okay, okay. and I also have this tablespoon of olive oil and that's gonna be added to the beans. Okay, so to get started, I'm just gonna start by cutting up my veggies. So I wanna make sure that all of my veggies are cut up and prepped before I try to put anything together. So I've got all of these tomatoes here. Now I know that I'm only making these two slices, so I'm probably gonna cut up maybe half of all of these tomatoes into halves. All I have is this regular butter knife. Okay, I'm gonna do my best to keep my bear claw. And I'm just gonna cut them right down the middle. Okay, just like that. It might be a little bit messy, but this just helps us make sure that we keep our fingers safe. Okay, so I'm just gonna cut these up. Okay, next for the broccoli, all we're gonna do is um, take our butter knife and try to cut just the heads off. Okay. okay, 
So what you'll find is that you get all of these little teeny tiny broccoli heads, okay? And we're just gonna have a few of these because um, they're gonna go on top of our pizza as well. So we're gonna make sure that those are small enough to fit on our pizza. Okay. All right, and then after the broccoli, I'm gonna do my pepper. So peppers can be a little bit difficult to cut, um, but they're, it's definitely doable with a butter knife, okay? So for the pepper, what we're gonna do is keep our bear claw, okay? With our stem, we're gonna cut that off, okay? And it, it doesn't really matter how far down you cut, but you just cut the stem off, okay? Just like that and you'll get this kind of piece where you had your stem and then you have the top of, of the pepper as well. And we just won't use that for, for the pizza. Okay, so now we have this little thing. We're gonna take the inside of this and pull it out. And you'll see a bunch of seeds and stuff. We're not gonna use that either. Okay, so now you have your pepper with the insides out and the top is cut off. We're gonna flip it on its top Okay, keep our bear claw and use our butter knife and go straight down the middle. Okay, so now you have two halves. All right, now this is completely up to you. It doesn't really matter what shape you want your pepper to be cut in because it's just gonna act as like a, a little topping on our pizza. So I know that all I'm gonna do is I'm probably only gonna use one half of this for now. And I'm gonna flip it so that it's laying like this, so that it's laying with the bottom on the, the cutting board, okay? I'm gonna keep my bear claw, and I'm gonna cut it down the middle one more time. So now I have these two pieces, okay? We've got these two pieces, and now I'm gonna lay it on this side on the cutting board, okay? Keep my bear claw, and just cut it into little strips. Okay, still using just a butter knife, okay? Keep that, yep, nice and slow. When it gets to this end, you're gonna stop, okay? And now you have all of these little strips, okay? So all these strips are gonna be cut up into little diced pieces, okay? So we're gonna take the first strip and cut it into little dices, okay? So we've got these here got these little pieces and they're just gonna be up here by the broccoli and the tomatoes. So cut those into small pieces, keeping your bear claw. Okay, just into tiny little diced pieces so that they can just go right on top of our pizza. Okay. All right, I think that I'm gonna go ahead and do this one. Here. going to take this zucchini okay and this was part of our ingredients list now zucchinis can be a little bit tough but all we have to do is just keep in mind that we have to keep our bear claw here and just cut nice slices okay so we're gonna cut nice slices here so you see that just a slice of zucchini okay and because our pizza is kind of small I'm gonna cut this in half. So now I have two halves of that slice. I'm gonna put that on my pizza. So I'm gonna go ahead and just cut some slices here. Okay, I'm gonna do one slice. Here's another slice, keeping my bear claw. Another slice here. And we'll do one more after that. So we'll have a total of five after the one that we cut first. Okay, and I'm gonna set this aside. So now I have these zucchini discs, okay? They're, they're slices of zucchini that I'm gonna cut in half again, okay? So I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna keep my bear claw here and just slice right down the middle. We've got our two slices here, okay? Bear claw cut right down the middle, bear claw cut right down the middle, 
We've got our carrots, we have our um, basil and oregano here, and we've got our corn, all right? So now we're gonna think about pizza sauce. So, so normally pizza sauce is made like as marinara sauce or with tomatoes or even like a garlic butter sauce. But what we're gonna make today is gonna be made out of these um, cannellini beans, all right? So in order to do that, I have to set up my ingredients. So I've got, I'll show you here. I have my beans here, my fresh basil and oregano here. Now the garlic, okay? Here's the garlic. I have all of my vegetables up in this corner. Now on the recipe, it says that it's one clove of fresh garlic crushed. Now, if you can look on, on this garlic, you can see that there's kind of a skin on it. And sometimes that can be kind of tough to take off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this on my cutting board and I'm gonna use this potato crusher, okay? I'm just gonna put that right on that garlic clove and push down until I hear it crack, okay? So it cracked. And now you can see that all of this skin, it just pulls right off, okay? So go ahead and pull off all the skin. Okay. So now we have our clean garlic clove. There's a little bit of a crack in there, but now we're gonna crush it, okay? So using this potato crusher, we're just gonna crush this garlic, okay? Just a couple times to really open up that flavor and make it taste really good. Okay, so now we have our crushed garlic here. All right, there's that. So here is my crushed garlic, all right? And then it also asks for a tablespoon of olive oil, and that's what I have in this, um, in this cup right here. So now that all of our ingredients are ready, um, we're gonna use this bowl and this potato crusher, and we're gonna mix our the cannellini beans, the basil and oregano, the garlic, the crushed garlic, and the olive oil in our bowl. Now I, I don't have a blender here, so I'm just gonna use this potato crusher to mix it all together. Okay, so first I'm gonna add my garlic, this crushed garlic here. And then I'm gonna add my olive oil. Okay. And then I'm gonna add my basil, kind of tear that up so that it's nice and small, because basil leaves can get kind of big. Okay, and then I have my oregano. I'm gonna dump that in my hand. Now these leaves are pretty small, so I'm not gonna tear those apart. I'll just toss those in, okay? So now I take my potato crusher and I just start mixing it all up. Okay. And this is going to be our pizza sauce. So once it gets to looking sort of like a, like a sauce or a spread, that's when we know that we've finished up with our crushing and our mixing. sort of like a pasty sauce, kind of just like pizza sauce is supposed to look like, okay? So now that we have our sauce ready and we have our toppings ready, we can start putting things together, okay? So I'm gonna just use the butter knife that I've been using. I'm gonna use this to wipe it off here. And I'm gonna take my first slice of pita bread, okay? And I just dip in here to get some sauce. And I'm gonna spread it all over my pita bread.
And there's my second slice. You can see it's just like putting butter on a piece of toast. Okay, and I'm gonna set this aside. So now I have my pizza here. I've got my carrots and corn, and I have my cut up vegetables, okay? So now I'm just gonna add toppings, whatever I like I'm gonna throw on there. So I'm gonna start with some corn, sprinkle that on. And now I'm going to take my shredded carrots and I'm going to sprinkle those on. Now I'm going to add the cut up vegetables that I made. So I'm just going to add some zucchini here. And now I'm going to add a little bit of my broccoli to my pizza. Just like that. And then last but not least, I've got my tomatoes. So I'm gonna put those on top. All right, and now I get to enjoy it. So here's the final product. This is our pump up pizza. Got a lots of vegetables on it. It's just kind of a less processed way of eating our pizza. Get a lot more vegetables in. Okay. All right. So I am going to go enjoy this now. Okay. Um, make sure that you always keep your bear claw when you're cutting up vegetables. This recipe, um, it asked for a lot of vegetables that needed to be cut up. Um, so just be very careful and you only need a butter knife. You don't have to use anything sharper than that. So, and that's all I've got for you today. Okay, good job today, guys. As soon as she appears on camera, no matter where you're at, I want you guys to all just kind of <laughs> give her a round of applause for me. Okay, so here's what happens. She's going to be standing right here. Now, we're going to use this pad for training purposes, okay? But just to be clear, just to make it really clear, when it's go time, and you know what I mean, go time, we got to hit that go button, I'm like, boom. That's my target. Am I trying to hit him in the shoulder? Probably not. I'm going to do much damage there. I need to shut this threat down quickly. Quickly. Okay? My hands are up. What I'm doing? Boom. I'm targeting right there. In self-defense and self-protection, is there any rule that says you have to wait to be hit? No. You know why? Because she could be a championship boxer. She could be one of the meanest people on the face of the earth. Although she's not. She's one of the sweetest people on the earth. I don't want to take that chance on getting hit first. I don't want to take, I can't take that chance. When my heart rate starts going, hey, I'm telling you, man, stay back. Get away from me. Get away from me. And they keep coming. You know what? Sometimes we have to go first. Sometimes we got to go first. So that pads up. And all I'm doing is, hey, I'm telling you, stay back. Get away from me. Take a couple, take two steps back from me. Okay, so when I say go, just keep coming. Go. Stay back, stay back, stay back. Go. Right? You can rewind that slow motion if you want, but here's how this thing plays out. So we'll do a slow motion this time for you, and then you can make it really super slow. I'm back. My hands are up, and I'm saying, now, power words come out, siren comes on. Get away from me, stay back, stay back. Coming slow. She doesn't stop. She's not doing what I've told her to do. 
go away, whatever. She keeps coming. So I have to assume her intention to get close to me is to, to damage and harm to me, to hurt me. So that might be, look, I told you, stay back, stay back, bam, and I go, okay? That's one thing. It's important. Hit and run. I don't want to fight her. I don't want to fight anybody. I just want to survive and go home to my family and have a nice dinner, okay? But when we have to protect and defend ourselves, sometimes we got to hit first. And then we get out of there. Do we hang around? Do we... Okay, let's say, let's say you knock them out. Do you gloat over them and say, ah, that teach you to mess with me, huh? Don't you, what, what do you think about that now, huh? No, you know what? I'm not in it for that. This person was going to try and do something bad to me. That was my reasoning. I told them to stop. I told them to get back. I said, get, get, get away from me. But they kept coming. They had the stink guy or the mean mug, whatever you want to call it, and giving it to me because I picked that up on rule number two in the, in the 10 second game. Creepy people. I seen them. I seen them come. I told them to stay back. They didn't do it. I couldn't get away. I had nowhere to go. I had nothing. I felt threatened. So I lost a preemptive strike. All right? When we hit. Okay? Now, here's what I teach people punch. I know. We're running close on time. When I teach people a punch, um, we've all done this before, so I'm just going to describe it. I really like to demonstrate it. When I teach people a punch is something like this. Oh, wow. Did you see how far back? Oh, oh wow. See her grin? Guess what? That's the result you're going to get. That's the result you're going to get if you try to do something like this. She's laughing at me. This? Not so funny, yeah? Okay, let me break it down for you before we leave. I've got a bucket of water. Yeah? And I've got a, I've got a towel. I take the towel and I put the towel down in the bucket of water. And it's dripping and it's running down. And I take that towel and I just go. And the towel goes splat. Water running everywhere. It's running down your shirt. It's wet. No effect. No result. Give me the towel back. Let me try another way. I take that towel and I dip it back down in that bucket of water. And it's pulled up out. It's dripping. Guess what I do this time? I take the towel this way. Played that game before? Yeah! Heck yeah, man, that towel will snap you. It's the same way our punch has got to be. I can't take my punch and just. It's got to come out. It's got to shoot out of there like a rocket, like it's on a big rubber band and, and, just, and just retract right back. Dude, stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Boom! Okay? In and out. Quickly! Quickly! One punch might do it if you practice and you're good. I'm a believer in what I call punches in bunches. Let's repeat that together because I made that rhyme up, you know, and I'm kind of fond of it. Punches in bunches. See how it works? What do I mean by that? I don't mean like bam, bam, bam. I mean like boom, 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 boom. I'm coming in punches in bunches. If I have to protect and defend myself, I've got to make sure it gets the job done. Okay? So those are just some tools. Key thing is, once that goes, and I don't, you know, if you knock them down or they fall over something or whatever, guess what? That's your chance. You made your own chance to do what? Get away! Because that's what it's all about. Now, Everything we've talked about, you see how it all ties in? The best self-defense is what? Don't be there. How do I go? If I can catch this threat coming in, because we've learned the 10 second game now, entrances, exits, doorways, anyone in the room makes me feel uncomfortable, and anything I can use as a weapon, a tool to protect and defend myself. That's great, because it gives me a chance to see the problem coming before it gets there, gets to me. And then we went to the next level where we said, 
Sometimes we can't get away. Sometimes I'm busy doing something, and all of a sudden, whoop, whoa, right there. Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, what's up? Hey, man, back off. We learn power words, and we can relate that to the fire truck going by outside. We don't even know. There could have been a hundred of them go by right now, but we don't know because they didn't have the sirens on. But if they got that siren on, we know something's going on because it draws our attention. That's what they're there for. We have sirens too. Get away. Stay back. Back off. Leave. Help. Stop. Powerful words. And I'm going to tell you, most people, when they hear that kind of stuff out there, they're going to look. They say, what's going on? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, hey, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Or they're going to pick up their phone because we all got phones now. And they're going to call somebody. All right? Finally, and I'm recapping all this stuff, but here's the last thing we learned is sometimes we got to defend. We got to protect ourselves and our loved ones. So here comes the threat. It's coming in. Hey, man. Hey, man. Back off. Stay back. Stay back. But they keep coming. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. They're not doing what I told them to do. Well, what, what do you do? You just put your hands in your pockets and say, okay, let's just be friends. They're not there to make friends. Okay? Back off. Stay away. Get back. Boom. And then I run. I get out of there. Remember the rabbit and the lion? Ducks down a hole. Lion goes, oh, no lunch for me today. Because this rabbit was faster and smarter than me. Best self-defense, just don't be there. Okay. We packed a bunch of stuff into like 30 minutes. I think we did pretty good, Reggie. There's a bunch of stuff in there. So rewind this and play it again. Here's what I want you to do. When you go out, wherever you're at right now watching this, when you get up, play the 10-second game, okay? Just start practicing, because pretty soon, it will become so natural to you, you know? You can close your eyes and, and bring a, 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 a fork and a spoon to your mouth with cereal, because we know what's going on there. Make it that natural to you. And pretty soon, you're, you're doing it and you don't even realize it. And you know what? The people around you are gonna be safer because of you, because you pay attention. You took it upon yourself to be responsible, be smart, right? It's important. So practice that 10 second game, okay? Don't get yourself in a bad situation. Don't let a bad situation include you into it. There's lots of crazy stuff going on. We're gonna be smarter than that, like the rabbit, right? Okay. I can't think of anything else. We've talked about power words. We've covered some mechanics and stuff. Um, Hopefully we can all get together next year, like we did last year, and I'll bring the pads out, and we have a little bit of crazy fun, all right? I miss you guys, hope you enjoy your summer, and I hope to see you guys very, very, very soon. Thanks for hanging out with us for this 30-minute session, and uh, just have a great summer. Thanks. Please be sure to visit Health Recovery Services by going to www.hrs.org. There you can find more information on our COVID-19 response and all of our programs. You can also catch the latest episode of HRS Presents by going to the DCS tab and clicking HRS Presents.